Hello everyone and welcome back to tutorial number three for the Airbus A320. I'm Emmanuel, I'm an Airbus pilot and let's go right into it. So we have already completed the preliminary cockpit preparation and the walk around and while the pilot monitoring is going to do the walk around, the pilot flying is going to start with the cockpit preparation procedure. I will have to split this one into two videos, the first one dealing with the flight deck setup, which is what you do first, and the second then dealing with the FMS setup, as that is really a whole topic on its own. So, let's go right into it. There is a general flow pattern that Airbus came up with and I'm going to first show you the general flow and then we will talk about all the details of what we are going to do in all of these specific flows. So the specific flow of pattern is quite easy. On the overhead panel you go left to right, bottom to top. So you start going up here, then you go up here in the middle and then you go up here on the right hand side like this. From there you move on to the um, forward main panel. Note that you do not do the FCU yet, don't do that, you do that later. But you move to the main panel and you go down like this. Go down here and then back up like a U. And then finally you move down to the pedestal and again you move um, from top to bottom this time and again left to right. So top to bottom like this, like this and like this this. Okay, so let's go ahead and have a little more in-depth look at this right now. So, as I mentioned, we start on the overhead panel here. The wiper has been off already. We make sure that none of the calls is um, pressed. It can happen that a button gets stuck here, so just make sure that that is not the case. Then, moving further up, we get to the oxygen panel and we turn on the crew oxygen supply, generally following the no white light philosophy with a few exceptions that we'll talk about. So next we meet the recorder panel. Over here we turn on the recorder ground control switch and what this does is that it automatically activates the cockpit voice recorder. Now this is required by many country regulations and pretty much anywhere in the world it's uh, done as standard nowadays. If this switch is not on then the cockpit voice recorder is automatically going to start recording when the first engine is started and since we are required to record our briefings we turn this on a little bit earlier okay then from here we move on to the cvr test now the cvr test needs to be conducted first flight of the day obviously for the crew so in order to conduct it we have a few things to do so first of all the ground control switch needs to be on and the park and brake needs to be set and note that you not only check the park and brake lever, but you actually make sure that you do have brake pressure over here and that the park brake indication is shown on the ECAM. Now, next up, it is a good idea to turn the speakers off for when you are going to conduct this test so that nothing on the audio can interfere with it. Okay, so speakers are off now. And now we press and hold the CBR test button. It takes a little while and then you get this sound. Now. Depending on the CVR that is installed in your airplane, you might get slightly different tones. So there is a CVR that only records the last 30 minutes and that one would give you either a continuous tone or a short tone. For a CVR that records 120 minutes, you might either get a short tone or a short tone and beep every 4 seconds. Or two short tones and a beep every 4 seconds. So either of those are acceptable outcomes of the CVR test. Now, when the CVR test is complete and after you've heard the audio feedback, be sure to turn the speakers back up as we still need to uh, listen in to ATC or, for example, to the ground engineers calling us on the ground interphone. Okay, then we go further up. Again, make sure that any white lights are uh, extinguished and we meet the evacuation panel. On here we've got the um, switch that determines whether only the captain or the captain and the purser can initiate the evacuation. Which switch position is used depends on airline philosophy. In my airline it's standard to turn into the captain only position. Alright, and with that we end up at the end of this panel already, making sure that there are no white lights illuminated. Then we move down to the middle. Over here there's a few things to do. The strobe light switch goes into the auto position. The nav and logo light switch is already in either the 1 or the 2 position. 
By default one is used, but if there is something inoperative in system one then we'd use system number two and any of the other switches is off. APU is needed and then on the right hand side we've got the seatbelt switch. The seatbelt sign can be turned on as soon as refueling is complete. As you can see down here our fueling is already complete so we can turn the uh, seat belts on. The no smoking switch goes in the, into the auto position and be very careful that you really have it in auto and not in on. This becomes relevant at a later stage in the flight. And the emergency exits are going to be armed. You don't need to turn them on, you don't need to do any manual tests. The cabin crew have their own switching on their panels where they can do tests of the system as desired. Now moving up then, it is not needed to actually conduct an annunciator light test in the A320, even though for Boeing people it's still nice and if you've got a child visiting the cockpit, you know, then um, it's always nice if you can show him the Christmas tree. But as mentioned, you don't need to run the test. However, you do need to decide if you want the annunciator lights either bright or dimmed. Now, usually during daylight you'd keep them bright and when it gets dark you'd turn them dim. If you turn dim during the day, the simulation kind of misrepresents it. They are much too bright in um, the dim position in daylight. So really be careful with that. Turn them to bright if it's daylight. Now also we have the dome light over here. Use it as needed. Alright, so going further up then we've got the um, cabin pressure landing elevation set to the auto position. And no white lights are illuminated. Going up to the air conditioning panel up here. Make sure that um, all the switches are basically in the 12 o'clock position and that there are no white lights illuminated. Going further up then we get to the electrical panel on and, and on here we actually need to do something. We need to check that the batteries are actually charging properly. So what we're doing over here is that first of all we go down to the ECAM, we press the ELEC push button and up here you've got the battery indications. By default voltage will be the same as on the overhead and by default we'll have zero ampere. But we need to make sure that the batteries are actually going to charge properly and that is also going to test the batteries. So what we do is the following. We go up to the overhead panel, take the battery switches, turn them off and then on again and this initiates a charging cycle and as you can see now you do get some significant ampere indications down here which indicates that the charging cycle is correct. And after um, the battery charging is observed, we can clear the ELEC page again by pressing the button again. So with that we made sure that the um, batteries are charging correctly. Now next up we go back to the uh, overhead panel and we go to the next higher panel which is the fuel panel. On here by default the fuel pumps will be turned off as soon as the refueling procedure is complete we are going to turn the switch into the on position so we are going to turn on all the um, fuel pumps over here. Now there is a little caution there in the AFCOM saying that if the fuel mode selector push button is unduly left in the manual position on the ground when the center tank left transfer push button and the center tank right transfer push button are not on the off position there is a possibility of fuel spillage in this configuration the center tank fuel transfer will not stop when the wing tanks become full so make sure that the mode selector over here is not actually in the uh, manual position with the fuel pumps on like this Okay, and the fuel cross feed is not turned on. Now, this one is a little bit of a gotcha because the manual and everybody tells you to extinguish white lights. But as you can see, when the cross feed is open, you actually get green open light as well there. So we don't want that. Make sure that the cross feed is closed. Like so. Okay, going up to the hydraulic panel, there is actually nothing we need to do on here. And then we get up to the fire panel. And over here, we need to run the fire tests for both of our engines. Now, how do you do that? Press the test button, make sure the squid and discharge lights come on, the fire extinguisher um, light comes on, and then we check the ECAM for the um, appropriate engine fire notification. And also we look down here and make sure that we get the red fire light below the um, engine master switch. Okay, so that's number one completed, and then we can do number two now. Again, same thing, squip and discharge and the fire push button light. On the ECAM we get the engine 2 fire indication and down here we also get the engine 2 fire light illuminating. Okay, 
And that is that. Then moving on to the right hand side of the overhead panel, there is actually not all that much you need to do over here. But depending on your airplane's equipment, you may have some um, cargo heating system installed. If you do have that on your aircraft, then make sure that it is set to the appropriate position on the temperature selector, depending on um, if any heating of the cargo compartment is required for the cargo you have on board. Now, if such heating is required, you would usually be issued a document from the dispatcher that is going to tell you about it. And depending on your airplane's equipment, you might just have an auto position there and it might just tell you that the ground crew has automatically um, or that the ground crew has manually set the correct temperature in the system automatically. And in that case, if you change the um, temperature selector, then obviously you would override that. So don't touch it if the um, light indicating that the ground crew has done it is illuminated. So moving further up then we've got the audio control panel and one thing we need to do over here is to pull the lower rightmost switch actually not the lower rightmost sorry it's a little different on the a330 that i fly but the pa switch that is the one you need to pull so pa needs to be active up here the reason behind that is that the pas need to be recorded on the flight recorder by regulatory requirement and that is what we do through the third audio control panel so that we don't hear them in the cockpit because this does not feed into the uh, loudspeaker system so we don't listen to this in the cockpit but the flight data recorder is going to record this line of the uh, communications okay then moving down we get to the main panel and over here we make sure that the correct q and h is set on the um standby instrument so in our case if we do get that information um, in the phoenix we can grab it right over here on the my flights app but depending on whichever system you use you might get different indications or different sources of your weather so depending on the app on your use just grab the q and h in our case it's going to be 1029 and we make sure that this is selected right on here make sure that the terrain on nd is turned off if you want to use it, turn it on later on during the taxi procedure, but we will talk about that in more detail when we actually conduct our taxi. Okay then, moving down to the DCDUs, we make sure that they are turned on, and then moving over to the right hand side, again make sure that the DCDU is turned on. Observe the accumulator pressure on the uh, triple indicator, and then moving up we've got our clock. On here, you want to check that the correct date is actually inside the system as well. So we don't only check the time like we have over here, but we also check the date. For that, you press the date button and you hold it. And then you check, okay, we've got the 10th of April 2024 on which I'm recording this and the clock is set to GPS. All right, and then you can release the date switch again and it goes back to time. Moving further up, we've got the um, anchor skid and nose wheel steering switch in the up position, and apart from that, all white lights are out. Moving down then to the pedestal, over here we make sure that our frequencies are tuned as appropriate. Now, usually in VHF-1 you would take the uh, active frequency, so for example Unicom on VATSIM when there is no ATC online or otherwise the appropriate ATC frequency, and on VHF-2 number two, you would have the um, guard frequency 1 to 1.5 active, and on the standby, you would set, for example, the ages or a company frequency or whatever might be applicable. VHF3 is normally going to be set to the data prompt so that our ACAS has uh, VHF data capabilities. Apart from that, make sure that the um, standby NAVs are not turned on and guarded. Moving down then to the audio control panel, we make sure that the correct audio selections are done. So we want to listen to VHF1 and 2, which you can tell by the white lower part down here sticking out. So if it's, turned, if it's pushed in, you can't listen to anything. If it's pulled out, you will listen to something. And on the transmitter knobs, we are going to select wherever we want to transmit on. Normally, it is a good idea to select it to the interphone or just have it off completely, unless you actually want to turn or want to talk to ATC. That is while you're parked on the ground. As soon as you get your startup clearance, you would turn on VHF1 and uh, then use that for the most part of the flight. Moving down then, weather radar, we checked that already in the preliminary pre-flight, but we just give a quick look over here to make sure that the uh, multi-scan and ground cloud suppression is in order, the gain is uh, set to something calibrated, the um, mode selector is either in weather plus turbulence or weather plus turbulence and hazard, or whatever your airplane has fitted there, but the actual system and the predictive wind shear are turned off. 
If you do have a manual tilt knob, then something like plus 5 usually works rather fine. Moving down then, we get to the um, speed brakes, which are retracted and not armed. Then we move on to the parking brake, which is um, as needed. So parking brake is going to be set if your um, brake temperatures are well within limits for our departure. But we hear, for example, they are at uh, 10 degrees. The limit is 300. So the brakes cool faster when the parking brake is released, but only release it when the uh, chocks are in place. Flap lever again agrees with the um, position on the ECAM. And then the first officer's side would also need to be set up. But the one thing that the PF needs to be or needs to do over here is to set the transponder. And on the transponder, normally we do uh, selections like this. So the mode selector is going to be standby on the ground. We only turn that to auto once we go for the pushback clearance. The selector between systems number one and two is going to be set to the pilot flying side. So if the captain is pilot flying, you use number one. If the FO is pilot flying, you use number two. So in our case, we're going to use number one. Altitude reporting is usually left on because as soon as the uh, mode selector up here is set to auto and the altitude reporting switch is on, the system would start transmitting in mode alpha, which is what the uh, ground crew need. For the squawk, if nothing has been assigned yet from air traffic control, you would select squawk 2000, which is the default IFR squawk. And then on the T-class mode selectors, you normally select the above position. So this one goes into above and the standby position on the actual T-class um, indications. All right. And that already concludes the cockpit preparation procedure. Now, next up, we are going to have a look in our FMS pre-flight, and that is going to be a dedicated video, since it is going to be a rather long one. And the final thing we got to do then is to set up the FCU, but that is going to be part of the uh, FMS pre-flight uh, video. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for watching. I do hope that you have enjoyed this one. If you learned something, be sure to let me know in the comments below. And if you're up for more, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. I would like to say thank you very much for watching. And if you really love what I'm doing over here, I would appreciate a small donation through the Buy Me Coffee link in the video description below. Thank you for watching and see you all again on the next one.